Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, EJ Finding Up Resources for Law Enforcement in FY 2022, hosted by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. This time, it's my pleasure to introduce one of today's presenters, David P. Lewis, Senior Policy Advisor within BJA, for some welcoming remarks and introductions. David. Uh, thank you, Daryl. Uh, I am David Lewis, Senior Policy Advisor here at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and would like to welcome you to today's presentation on behalf of our Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Amy Sullivan, and the newly appointed BJA Director, Carlton Moore, and BJA's Principal Deputy Director, Kristen Mahoney. I will look at today's presentation. I will highlight uh, scheduled funding opportunities available to law enforcement and resources that are available under the, the training and technical assistance programs funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Uh, BJ is one of six divisions under the Office of Justice Programs. OJP is one of the three grant-making components under DOJ. The goal of OJP is to provide funding training and technical assistance, research, and statistical information to the entire criminal justice community. What are the goals of the Office of Justice programs? First of all, it's to prevent, prevent and reduce crime through a comprehensive approach. Also to engage criminal justice agencies in an at-risk community. Improve communication between uh, communities and agencies. And finally, make funding available and resources to deliver effective outcome-based capabilities and programs. Uh, the BJA mission is very simple. Um, as mentioned, BJA is one of the divisions of the Office of Justice Programs, and our mission is to specifically to provide leadership and services and provide these services and resources to you as our constituent. We'll complete this mission by provi providing uh, to the best of our ability leadership and services to address your needs. With the ever-changing times, the reduction of violent crime and strengthening communities leads, B, leads BJA's mission goals. Since this is a funding um, webinar, let me touch base on a few types of funding that are made available to you through the Bureau of Justice Assistance. First, we have discretionary funding. These are usually competitive. Your agency would apply directly to the Office of Justice Program Division making the funds available through a posted solicitation. The application usually goes through a peer review process. This could be internal or external, and the external peer reviewers are from the field. Information about becoming a peer reviewer will be discussed later in the presentation. Next, we have formula grants. These are usually non-competitive. They are handled usually by a state administrating agency or a BJA-approved fiscal agent. Funding of this may be statutory or determined by Bureau of Justice Assistance itself. I urge anyone having any questions on BJ funding or other funding listed in the OJP division solicitation to reach out to the agency with questions or the need for clarity. I would like to introduce our presenters for today's webinar regarding uh, today's BJ on BJ funding. Um, First, we have Deborah Meter, who's a policy advisor here at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Second is Alyssa Rumsey, senior policy advisor. Next, you'll hear from Maria Fryer, policy advisor, again here at BJA. Then uh, our final um, presenter for today will be Christy Bracken, senior policy advisor here at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. I would now like to introduce Deborah Meter, who will continue our presentation for today. Great. Thank you so much, David. Hello, everyone. Thank you and uh, welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, I am going to be talking about two of our uh, really exciting funding opportunities that are coming up. The first one is our what we call our Valor Initiative. And this, this initiative um, is an initiative that focuses on providing law enforcement with safety, wellness, resiliency, and survivability tools, training, and resources. Um, we do this through a comprehensive approach. We provide no-cost training to law enforcement agencies. What we're looking for uh, for FY 2022 is to provide um, information on four categories, those being 
Um, those being resilience, officer safety and wellness, a comprehensive officer safety and wellness, uh, law enforcement suicide, and roadside, um, roadside safety training. We expect to provide $13 million in awards, and we will be giving out four awards uh, with an estimated award amount of $3 million each. For that, uh, those who are eligible to apply are state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies, as well as nonprofit and for-profit institutions of higher learning. We also have, for FY22, uh, the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, also known as SACI. This initiative looks to provide um, awards and, and funding for uh, law enforcement to address the um, unsubmitted sexual assault kits that are in law enforcement's custody um, and to also provide closure to victims. This we do through a comprehensive approach uh, in providing funding for inventorying, for testing, for tracking kits, um, also for investigating leads and prosecutions, and to support victims. In FY22, we will be providing approximately 40 million, uh, 40 awards, my apologies, um, totaling approximately $60 million. Um, ad eligible applicants for this are state law enforcement agencies as well as local government and uh, government non-law enforcement agencies and prosecutor's office. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Alyssa Rumsey. Thank you, Deborah. There we go, thank you. Uh, not that important, really, just like my name and title. Um, and so you know where to reach me via Google. All right, next slide. So um, this um, forthcoming solicitation is called the Collaborative Crisis Response Training Program. And some of you may be familiar with it because it has been competed in, in past years uh, and will be competed again this year. Um, and I hate to just read this slide to you because it is, it is a lengthy one, um, but I think you'll recognize it as a, another example of a great program that BJA supports in terms of working with law enforcement, um, community corrections, correctional officers, um, et cetera, to work in the most effective way possible with people with behavioral health issues, intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities on the job. Um, so we anticipate that this solicitation will release in the second quarter of fiscal year 2022. Um, so keep your eyes out uh, for this one in the coming days. Uh, we expect to receive a little more than 20 applications just to give you a sense maybe of uh, the competition as it were in terms of how many people typically apply for this particular program. And we anticipate making $505 million in awards, not 500 million, 5 million. Um, and eligibility uh, includes states, units of both governments, fairly recognized Indian tribal governments as determined by the Secretary of Interior. Of course, you can always go to BJ, BJ's website to find out more about this particular program. This is another law enforcement program. Uh, as you can see, it's called the Academic Training to Inform Police Responses. My understanding that the funding statute for this particular program emphasizes the word academic training such that we are already working with an academic institution on this work. Um, and in essence, it involves the creation of a 40-hour curriculum that's based on the Memphis model. Some of you are probably familiar with that. Um, this model covers a range of topics important to law enforcement, such as mental health, disability, substance use, officer wellness, de-escalation, so on and so forth. And again, you can go to our website to read more about this particular initiative. Next slide. And that, with that, I'll pass it over to Maria Fryer. Great. Thank you, Alyssa. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about um, the national initiative, Justice and Mental Health Training and Technical Assistance. 
And this is um, a new initiative this year. It's actually a, a recompete of national training and technical assistance. Um, there are five separate categories for multiple justice and mental health programs to deliver site-based, program-specific, and broader training and technical assistance for the field. Each category is seeking applications for a separate national initiative, and applicants can apply to more than one category, but must submit a separate and complete application for each. All five categories involve providing training and technical assistance to either site-based grantees or the field more broadly. And specifically, categories two through five are geared um, towards law enforcement and will work with law enforcement um, to um, improve responses to people with mental health disorders or behavioral health disorders, uh, people with co-occurring substance use, and uh, people with disabilities. The Connect and Protect program is, um, is something, is a new program, although we did compete it last year, and this program provides funding to state, local, and tribal governments to improve law enforcement and community responses to people with behavioral health needs. It is part of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, and you may recognize that it has a lot of similarities to the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, and it's uh, through the same funding legislation. However, it is geared specifically towards law enforcement and aims to reduce unnecessary law enforcement contact um, while connecting people to needed treatments and support. Um, it does require a collaboration with a mental health partner, very similar to JMHCP, and some example model responses um, that can be taken up by the, this program are the co-responder team, you may be very familiar with that, of course, crisis intervention team, um, and the, the academic training initiative can provide a lot of resources there that the program that Alyssa was just talking about can provide a lot of resources. Um, for crisis intervention, and as well as this program can also cover mobile crisis teams and intensive case management teams and uh, law enforcement mental health integrated 911 dispatch. And um, you may be familiar with uh, clinicians um, being embedded within a law enforcement agency or 911 call center um, to respond to calls for service. So just real briefly, you can see the average amount of the award is up to 550,000. And um, for those that are planning to submit an application um, for the Connect and Protect program, um, they can take advantage of many BJA training and technical assistance opportunities as they're planning an application. Um, and one of, one of the training and technical assistance tools is the Police Mental Health Collaboration Toolkit. It's an online resource to help agencies and their behavioral health partners to learn about um, what is a police mental health collaboration, um, how to plan, how to implement, uh, what is best practices for training, managing, measuring, and delivering behavioral health programs. Um, and some other opportunities are those um, such as the, the law enforcement mental health learning sites. Um, we have BJA uh, supports 14 law enforcement mental health learning sites. They all are experts in what they do, and they are a free training and technical assistance resource. Uh, and they also can host virtual or in-person site visits, um, which allow for if you can if you can travel there, um, direct observation. But oftentimes we have agencies also take advantage of virtual. Uh, peer to peer learning. And this slide right here is um, intentional. I placed it in the slide deck so that our participants today can refer back to it, um, some of these resources as they think through and plan uh, their application for the Connect and Protect uh, Law Enforcement Behavioral Health Program. So I just encourage you to um, come back to this slide and um, explore it further. Um, a lot of these resources are very much, they're, you know, quick, easy reads, um, and they just kind of give, provide you an overview with um, 
some of the products and tools that are available. Uh, on this slide, you'll notice uh, taking the call national conference. Um, on this website are all the resources from uh, national conference last October, where we explored uh, community responder models and some of the changing landscape and how uh, communities and partnering with law enforcement are responding to people in behavioral health crisis. And then the best practice guide here at the bottom, um, that actually goes back to the academic training initiative and it's posted on their website. And lastly, uh, have these publications of note um, and these here above are links and screenshots to just a few additional resources and publications to help you get started on planning your program. Um, planning up front really helps um, with the strong application and gathering stakeholders. Um, as you can see, there's a publication on co-responder teams um, or how to identify and reduce high utilizers and public safety services. And um, they're all brief and intended to help you and assist you with your application. Well, next, I would like to hand it back over to my colleague, um, David Lewis. Okay, my first program that I want to share with you today in my section is dealing with body-worn cameras. This program is specifically designed to assist agencies to fund the purchase or lease of body-worn cameras. These funds can be used for both new implementations or expansions of an existing program. This program has become very popular with a number of issues that have come to the forefront with regard to law enforcement responsibility. Uh, this program estimates that uh, they should have available um, $35 million uh, available to the field. And these, these awards are based on the department size, the number of body-worn cameras that are looking to be purchased or leased. Uh, award, awards will vary from $10,000 to $2 million, again, based on department size and the number of cameras. Eligible, eligible agencies include state, local, tribal, and territorial law enforcement, plus prosecutors, corrections, universities, and state regional consortiums that do law enforcement work. Uh, there's also a current microgrant program addressing small, rural, and tribal agencies. Next, we're going to talk about the Harold Rogers Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, or it's also known as PDMP. This program strengthens states and territories' uh, PDMP programs. The focus is for tracking prescribers and to identify issues like overprescribing, doctor shoppers, and crossing state lines. This also works to share information for electronic health records and health information exchanges. The dollar amount made available for this program is $31 million. And um, we look at, um, it's broken down to uh, field-based programs and the TTA program. The average field award is estimated to be up to $1.5 million. Uh, this is limited to just states and U.S. territories. Now, the next program I'd like to discuss is Smart Policing Initiative, or SPI. This program is designed to provide resources to law enforcement with a focus on local crime problems. Support promising practices on and how to respond to these particular programs. It also targets operational or crime reduction issues. And finally, looking for innovation and intervention, which is extremely important when applying for this particular program. Uh, something that may be innovative in your area may have already been proven in another area. So you need to be very cautious and look at some other programs that have been submitted under this particular program. This project does allow for partnerships with a, research, with a researcher. Program will have a, this program will have approximately $8 million available, and, and um, we're going to look at applications can be submitted by law enforcement or non-law enforcement agency asking, acting as a fiscal agent. The next program I'd like to discuss is the Crime Gun Intelligence Center, or CJIC as it's called. This is a partnership with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. This is a competitive program 
for state, local, tribal, and territorial law enforcement. There must be a very clear precipitous increase of gun-related violent crimes in that particular area. The applicants must work in conjunction with ATF and will utilize available intelligence, technology, and community engagement. The goal is to identify unlawfully used firearms and enhance the prosecution of these perpetrators. This program has a priority with the increased number of ghost guns being made available in our local communities. This project has $5 million of it. $5 million available, and the estimated average award will be uh, $700,000. Uh, applicants will be for state and local law enforcement agencies. Uh, the Rural Violent Crime Reduction Initiative, this is a community-based program to support training and, te and technology. This initiative also focuses on communities instituting crime prevention programs and work in partnership with victim service providers. Uh, this particular program is expected to make $9 million available, but there is some limitations on applications. So the recommendation is that you check the BJ website, not only for this program, but all the programs that are being shared with you today, and you can get a, a more in-depth overview of any of these funding opportunities. The next program I'd like to share with you is Intellectual Property and Enforcement Program, or IPEP as it's called. This program is specifically designed for the support of task forces to work in conjunction with federal agencies when it comes to counterfeit and pirated products affecting health, safety, and the economy. These task forces enhance the, the capacity not only for law enforcement, but also for prosecution. This effort also includes prevention programs to educate the community and train officers in these areas. This program will have approximately $2.4 million available to state, local, tribal, and territorial task forces. The average expected award will be $375,000. Just want to add, there is one change to this program in this fiscal year, FY22. Since this is a 24-month program, successful applicants from FY21 are not eligible to apply in FY22. Also, no vehicles or unmanned aerial devices are allowed to be funded under this particular program. With that, I'd like to turn over the presentation to my colleague, Christy Bracken. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christy Bracken, I'm Senior Policy Advisor, and I'm looking forward to talking to you uh, for the next couple of minutes about some additional funding that we have available um, at BJA to assist you all. In addition to some of the training and technical assistance that we offer that, that isn't always um, taken advantage of. So let's talk about one of the first programs. So we have the um, Edward Byrne Criminal Justice Innovation Program, what we commonly call BCJ, BCJI. For some of you who have been around for a little while, you may know this program as the Community-Based Crime uh, Reduction Program. The purpose of the BCJI program is really the community-oriented um, focus of reducing crime in hotspots. For those of you who, who work in this field, you know that oftentimes it's not the entire city uh, or everyone in, in a community that's causing a problem. It's a specific area within that community um, that tends to be the source of, of a lot of the crime. And so what the BCJI program does is it focuses on those hot spots, but it also asks that you partner not only law enforcement, but with your community partners, your other stakeholders, um, your service providers, to really implement a comprehensive program that's one place-based, um, that looks at how data is being used, um, that looks to engage community, and that really focuses on partnership. So with the BCJI program, so with the BCJI program, of course, it's, it's a very thought after program. Um, we always receive more applications than we can support. Last year, uh, we, we're expecting 60 applications this year. Um, we only uh, are going to be able to support 14 applications. There's about $22 million available for, for awards. 
the eligibility, uh, eligibility information is pretty standard um, as far as who uh, can apply for this award, and the average award is around $1.4 million. So I would encourage you to take a look at the solicitation and really look um, of, of what's being required. Really think about who your partners are that you would want to work with you on this program um, because, you know, we will get more applications that we can support and you want yours to, to rise to the top. Another program that I'm sure you're all familiar with is our uh, Edward Byrne Justice Assistance Grant Program. This is the JET, commonly referred to as the JAG program. Um, this program is one of the main ways that we here at BJA support state, local, and tribal uh, jurisdictions. In um, FY21 alone, we gave out almost $187 million um, in JAG funds. With the JAG funds, it's a, you know, David mentioned at the beginning that there are discretionary grant programs and there are formula grant programs. The BCJI uh, program is a discretionary grant program, meaning it's competitive. Whereas in the JAG program is a formula-based program. Um, your state, states get their JAG allocation based on their share of violent crime um, and their population. So there's a formula that goes into that, and there's a lot of information available uh, on the JAG program and what that formula looks like, what state allocations have been in the past. Um, the, the state allocations go to the state administrating agencies. I'm sure we have some of you all represented in this 658 participant number, um, and those funds are then uh, passed through um, to the locals. And then we have some local, uh, we have some agencies that, that qualify uh, based on their population and, and crime data for uh, local uh, JAG funding. The JAG funding can be used to support personnel costs, um, equipment, supplies, um, training and technical assistance, um, technology, all sorts of things um, is what that funding can be used to support in these primary uh, focus areas. Uh, law enforcement programs, prosecution courts, crime prevention, education programs, I won't read them all to you, but I will say that, you know, when we take a look at um, where folks tend to fall, I would say about 57, 58 percent um, of the, the funding for the JAG program is used to support law enforcement type programs. Another program that we have is the, the Paul Coverdale Forensic Science Improvement um, Grants Program. This, the, real, the objective of this program is pretty much to improve the quality and timeliness of forensic science in, in medical examiners' corner offices services. Uh, we have specific objectives when it comes to the Coverdell um, program. We want to eliminate the backlog um, when it comes to the analysis of uh, forensic science evidence. That could be firearm examinations, latent prints, um, toxicology, digital evidence, um, trace evidence. We want to be able, this funding can also be used to train and assist um, laboratory personnel. Um, address emerging issues um, within that field as well as emerging technologies. Funding can also be used to educate and train uh, pathologists and to fund um, systems that help facilitate the accreditation um, of, of the laboratory. We expect to make 10 awards um, in the next fiscal year. And similar to um, the BCGI program, this is also a discretionary program, a very competitive program. Uh, we anticipate receiving 90 applications and we'll, be only, we'll only be able to support about 10. The average award um, is $400,000. And I'll let you pay close attention to the um, eligible applicant information. Another program that might be of interest to you all is our post-conviction testing. Um, of DNA evidence um, program. This program um, really looks at working um, on the identification of, um, looking at the identification of um, cases that where post-DNA testing could result, um, actually could show actual innocence. And so, you know, when we think about the objectives for this program, you know, 15% of, of the funding that you might apply for under this program can be used um, to assist in identification of those cases. 
Then, you know, funding is used to review um, the cases. Funding is also, you can be used to locate um, biological evidence um, as well. And so there are four different things that this funding, that funding under this program um, can be used to support. This is also a discretionary uh, program. Um, we expect to have uh, 15 applications, hopefully 12 awards. The average award under this program is about $500,000. And so I would encourage those of you who work in this space to, to, act, to really take a look at this program. I think you're, you're sensing a, seeing a theme here. Um, our, another program that we have um, is the strengthen, Strengthening the Medical Examiner and Coroner System uh, program. The two objectives of this program are to support um, a forensic pathology fellowship and to provide resources that aid um, in the accreditation um, for medical examiner's offices. Those are the two primary objectives of this particular funding. Uh, we expect to make seven awards, seven fellowships. Uh, the next year and to make uh, 10 awards as far as accreditation. This is also a discretionary program, so it's competitive. You will find that most of our programs outside of the, the JAG program the, is our competitive program. So this, this kind of concludes um, the discussion around um, grant funding that is available. One of the things that we find that we offer at the Bureau of Justice Assistance is training and technical assistance. And our TTA is something that is associated with our programs that you will see, but we offer um, training and technical assistance to the field. And that's not always taken um, advantage of. So, so I would encourage you all, as I go through the specific TTA programs that are out there, but I would encourage you all to visit the BJA NTAP um, website and think about, you know, different areas that you might need support in and take advantage of the, of the TTA that's out there. Any training and technical assistance uh, that we provide um, to, to the field is, is at no charge. So let's talk about some specific TTA programs that are available. So David talked about the Smart Policing Initiative. So we have the Smart Policing Grant Program. Um, folks that participate um, in the Smart Policing, Smart Policing or SPI program, they also have access to TTA to help them implement um, the programs that they ask for funding under the SPI initiative. Um, the TTA provider is specific to SPI grantees. How, however, though, you know, since the start of the program, there have been 93 projects funded under the SPI program which is a good thing, right? Because there are lessons that we've learned uh, from those SPI programs that we've previously funded. So the SPI program has a website. It's smart-policing.com. And if you visit their website, you can learn about what the work that's happening in the different SPI sites that might be applicable to the things that you might be trying to accomplish in your jurisdictions. There's also webinars. I, I noted a webinar um, on technology how to use technology as, as a force uh, multiplier for law enforcement. There are also um, publications on uh, social networking analysis, um, working with research partners. So there are lots of resources um, available uh, on the SPI website. And although you wouldn't be able to get quote unquote technical assistance through that program, if you were to apply for grant funding and uh, become an SPI grantee, then you would have access to that training and technical assistance that's available. We expect to make one TTA um, award uh, to support the SPI program, and that award um, will be uh, about $500,000. Similar to the SPI program, those applying for funding under the Forensics um, Training and Technical Assistance Program will also have access um, to training and technical assistance as a part of that program. We don't currently have a website set up um, for this, but it, it, it's a similar similar concept. You know, we, you all apply for funding to get the grants to, to do these projects, and then we um, provide the training and technical assistance to help you implement your program. 
And similar to SPI, we plan to make one award. I will say that these the TTA programs, as they're funded, are discretionary um, as well. National Public uh, Safety Partnership TTA program, I actually oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the Public Safety Partnership. And so I might have to have one of my, uh, one of my colleagues uh, cut me off if I start talking too long um, about PSP. But the PSP program is a training technical assistance program um, that works with jurisdictions that are experiencing high rates of violent crime. What's kind of unique about the PSP program as compared to the other two I just mentioned is that you can apply directly uh, to the PSP program uh, to get training and technical assistance. Um, the, as a part of our TTA protocol for the PSP program, we work um, with these jurisdictions that have high rates of violent crime. We've worked in over 40 jurisdictions. There are currently um, 23 active PSP sites. And we work with them in, in core focus areas. We work with them on enhancing their federal partnerships, gun violence, crime analysis, investigation, technology, constitutional policing, you name it. If it, if it, if it in some way will enhance um, a local jurisdiction's ability to better address uh, violent crime, then it, it's an area that we support. So we typically bring in five to 10 cities um, every year uh, to support the PSP program. Uh, we also, there's a, a website, the National Public Safety Partnership website. On that website, there's a link to our clearinghouse that has publications, webinars, podcasts, uh, things of that nature that, that you all could take a look at, take advantage of if there are things that you think might be helpful to you. Um, we also have a virtual uh, learning academy, law enforcement centered learning academy that has coursework uh, for sworn officers that they can also take advantage of. Um, things like gun crimes, uh, leadership, uh, crime scene processing. So that's a, a, a technical assistance program that you can actually uh, apply to, the PSP program. And we will be soliciting for two um, technical assistance providers uh, for the PSP program. One to do some of our local, one category will focus on our local um, law enforcement strategy support. So that's more of direct support uh, to, to the jurisdictions that are accepted into the program. And then the second category of funding is more of the infrastructure support, which is looking at the website, the virtual academy. Uh, we hold um, annual summits uh, for PSP sites, so uh, those sorts of things. So that's PSP. Two awards. Yep, mention that. What I was saying was that we are uh, starting our solicitation season. Our solicitation season runs March through June, so you will start seeing uh, solicitations for funding uh, being posted on a regular basis. Solicitations are typically open anywhere from 45 to 60 days. Some may be open longer, so you really want to pay attention uh, to um, the deadlines uh, for the solicitations. If you want, I would also suggest that you subscribe, if you haven't already, um, to news from BJA so that you can receive updates uh, when solicitations become available. Other resources uh, that we have uh, for grantees, uh, grants.gov, uh, obviously, if you have need assistance with your SF-424 or SSLL, there's a customer support hotline. There's also an email hotline. Um, grants.gov also has um, information on the different grant opportunities, not just uh, BJA, but all of the federal law enforcement, excuse me, all of the federal program offices that offer grants. So you might see COPS grants on there, OBW grants on there. Um, and within OJP, the, the Office of Juvenile Justice, Office of Victims of Crime. So I really encourage you to, to really check out grants.gov as well. Just Grants, um, you know, we recently launched the Just Grants um, platform last year. And so if, you, if there's technical support that you need when it comes to just grants, they also have a customer support hotline as well as an email um, address that you can, you know, who can answer questions for you. They provide support on, then there's the OJP response center that can provide general solicitation support and offers general assistance. So say you have a question about a particular funding opportunity, 
Um, you can email, you can chat, you can call the toll-free number. Um, there's support in that way as well. And again, um, just another, so okay, the OJP.gov, subscribing to there will give you information um, on all the, the grant opportunities that are available at OJP. So as David mentioned um, in the beginning, BJA is just one component of OJP. You have the Office of Victims of Crime, you have the National Institute of Justice, the Office of Juvenile Justice, Link State Prevention, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and the SMART Office. Um, and so all those different opportunities that may be avail available at those offices, if you subscribe to the OJP.gov, you'll get those opportunities as well. So this is just a, a list uh, of different resources. Um, the financial guide, um, I would encourage you to take a look at that. The financial, the online grants management training is one thing to apply uh, for a grant and be successful at obtaining that grant, but it's a whole nother thing to actually manage that grant and all the things that come along uh, with, with the grant as far as special conditions, reporting requirements, programmatic reporting requirements, financial reporting requirements, things of that nature. So I would encourage you to take a look um, at that online financial manage, management training, learning what's allowable and what's not allowable, you know, when it comes to expending your, your funds. The OJP uh, application resource guide is just another, another resource for you. We also have um, uh, application, applicant, educant ser applicant education series. So if you want to access previous funding webinars, you know, we go over a lot of information. And if you're like me, you may not catch it all the first time. So this is an opportunity to actually go back and listen to it again and, and make notes and, and you know, with, with things that you actually do want to follow up on. And something else I would encourage um, folks to do is to become a peer reviewer. You know, one of the best ways to learn how to write a grant is, is to review grants, right? Um, and so we, we have a, we have openings there. We're all, I shouldn't say we have openings, but we're always looking for folks um, to become peer reviewers. So if you have an up-to-date resume, um, you know, I would encourage you, if you're interested, to apply to become a BJA peer reviewer. Being a peer reviewer, I think, really helps you understand the application process. It helps you understand what we're looking for in applications when it comes to um, our discretionary funding. And I've had folks that I've encouraged to do this before uh, tell me that they felt better prepared uh, to help their agency uh, when it comes to applying for grants after having served as a peer reviewer. And this final, if you, if you don't re remember anything else that, that I say, I strongly encourage you to, you know, take a picture of this slide, mark it in your memory. There are two deadlines now um, as a part of the Just Grants process. There is um, a, a, a two-step process, so you have to submit your SF-424 and an SF-LOL at grants.gov. That has a deadline. And then you, all, you also have to then submit your full application into just grants. So make sure that when it comes time for you to apply for funding that you pay attention to both the deadlines, right? Because if you miss the if you miss the deadline in step one, you can't proceed uh, to step two. And I would just hate to see you know anyone miss out on a funding opportunity, being able to apply for a funding opportunity um, because there was some confusion around um, the deadline. So remember this if you don't remember anything else. There, it's a two-step process, and there's two deadlines. So make sure you pay attention to that when you're looking at the solicitation. And finally, you know, we always want to stay connected um, with you all, uh, with the Phil, and so we have various ways that, that you can stay connected with us. Um, you can text OJP uh, to subscribe to um, for email updates. You, there, we have social media. We have a Facebook page. I encourage you to visit and, and like our Facebook page. We also have a Twitter feed as well, so if, if you're not following us on, on Twitter, I encourage you to, to follow us on Twitter. And of course, we are, we're always sharing information um, on funding opportunities, publications, different initiatives, things of that nature that we're working on um, on the BJA website. So there, there's lots of ways for you to stay connected to us. 
And this is just another quick reference slide that kind of summarizes um, the things that I talked about before. So solicitation content, grants.gov, and just grants. So as you, as you think about um, applying for opportunities for funding, these are the, the different um, places but that you may have questions that would be able to answer them for you. So with that, I've noticed that David's been responding to, to some questions um, in the chat box. And so I will turn it back over uh, to Daryl. And we will happy, any of us, myself or my colleagues, are happy to answer any questions that you all might have. So thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks so much, Christy. And to the rest of the panelists for their presentation. So we have about 10 minutes left in the program today. What we'll do is, is look into the Q&A. We've been great at entering those as we proceeded through, and um, we'll just cover a couple things that are in there. But I just want to note up front, there's been several questions on the slides in the presentation, and uh, the slides, PowerPoint, and transcript from today will be posted to the BJ website approximately 10 to 15 business days. And you'll also receive a notice through email uh, once you registered, you um, get a notice on when those items are posted. So I'll be on the lookout for that when that comes through. So the first question is regarding SACI. Does it cover accreditation and licenses for medical examiners and coroners? So this is Christy. I, I'm not. I don't think that SACI covers that. Um, I'll, I'll. I can follow up if you want to send me a, an email directly um, with the person that manages that program. But that is covered under the the medical. Um, which one was it? <clears throat> That, that is under the law enforcement division when it comes to medical examiners. Yeah, so, that, that um, yes. Yeah, so that, that is under there. If you have any more specific questions, just feel free to um, to reach out and we'll answer those directly to you. Thanks. And, and as mentioned, the uh, OJP Response Center is a great resource as well for those types of questions here on the top left, um, grants at ncgs.gov. So. Definitely feel free to reach out to them directly as well. Uh, regarding the smart policing initiative, we um, estimated award amounts and for how many projects are going to be funded for that. Uh, I think the um, the number that they have up there was seven, uh, but um, we we get a lot of applications in. I said the key is. Um, innovation and intervention, extreme intervention. So, um, but you can go on to the SPI, SPI section of the BJ website. It'll show you past awards and give you some ideas of what's already been funded. But again, um, reach out, any clarifications that you wanna make, uh, please just let us know. And I Realize it's a it's a rolling release, but is there just general quarter two for FY twenty two is ending uh, coming up? So is there any insight on when these can start to be released from BJA? Perhaps next week or two or three. Uh, we all have we we've, we've all been working here. The, the advisors that are on this call um, submitting the approval processes, and you know we're. Our goal is to get almost everything out by the second quarter, but that's uh, ongoing, like you said, Daryl, on a, a rotating basis. And Dave, while you're on the Body Worn Camera uh, program, in regards to that, is it only to purchase or lease VWCs, or can you also apply for funding to continue uh, the Body Worn Camera example to cover storage or service plan costs uh, if the cameras were already purchased? Uh, no, storage is not an acceptable um, uh, cost under that, um, but you can get some service, like if you need products, um, like new clips and those kind of things. But storage is one of the things that is not covered under body worn camera. In regards to the Coverdale grant, uh, can funds be used for projects that are non-opioid or synthetic drug related? namely for projects to reduce the backlog in the firearms ballistic unit. So one of the, the purpose areas was a firearms backlog. So I would say yes. Uh, regarding the peer review process, is that uh, 
there are a lot of interest in that. And once again, like this person has applied several times and hasn't heard back. Is there an official process uh, just emailing uh, per that one slide? Is that the correct process to apply for this year? Yes, that's the correct process to apply. Uh, the other thing that we've had people do in the past, if you see a particular program that you feel that you have a, a strong background in, um, you can, when there's a solicitation out there, uh, reach out to the contact people showing your interest in and in possibly being a, a peer reviewer. Now, we've had that happen in the past uh, because we get a number of them in here and, um, you know, filling peer review panels is, is extremely difficult for us sometimes because of the number of programs happening at the same time. Is there going to be funding for the BVP program below who's proof best partnership for 2022? Yeah, that's an ongoing program that's continuing to be funding and uh, that would be listed on the BJ website. And I don't want to keep pointing to you, David, but this one's about BWC again. There was a mention of a micro grant within that. Can you expand on that a little bit on what the micro grants are with that? The micro grants were specifically for uh, small rural tribal law enforcement agencies um, that um, that program is is ongoing right now. They're identifying those, but um, there's requirements on side of the department. Um, so um, I would reach out, you know, like I said, um, reach out to the contact in the body worn camera program and they can get you uh, a little more information on that. Can the JAG grant be used to purchase equipment such as police vehicles? Yeah, that is that I, I believe vehicles is the only one that um, that the JAG one is one of the ones that are permissible, but we just got um, um, guidance that unmanned aerial devices or support or any of that stuff is not acceptable. That that was one vehicle that's not acceptable under any of our grant programs right now. I'm seeing several questions come in about um, just grants and grants.gov items. Uh, I would just at this point uh, want to direct you if you do have questions about the SF424 LLL, as well as uh, there was a question about a DUNS number to do contact these entities uh, individually. Uh, there's a robust FAQ section on each of the sites that you can look up and get information on all the changes that have taken place over the past year regarding that and those deadlines and submissions. So. Definitely a great resource for you there. There I see one in there about another body worn camera one, for example, if they're upgrading to Axion. Um, that that you have to separate that storage charges out of that because it's an upgraded program. Um, again, storage it, is still not covered. Generally, are there opportunities available to on profits through BJA crime prevention activities. Could they maybe expand on that question a little bit? I'm not sure I understand what's being asked. In fact, they yeah, there was a mention, you know, as far as uh, cold cases or missing um, individuals, uh, anything related to that. What was the section you mentioned about for profits there? I, I missed what that part was. Um, the question is, will there be grants to help crimes uh, as a nonprofit entity? Uh, there are many grants for crime prevention, law enforcement, but having trouble finding some for cold cases or missing uh, individuals. I think we do have one out there for cold cases, but uh, the one thing I would advise people is if they see anything that's close to what they're looking for is um, look at the eligibility section of the solicitation because it tells you very specifically, you know, if it's state, local, nonprofit, university, tribal. So all the awards that come out, that's something that you can look at uh, on the actual solicitation itself. Thanks so much. Christy, I would add to what David just said while while he was talking. Um, 
we have so many programs at DJA, so I apologize. You, you guys got a sample of us and not all of us, so we're, we're not as familiar with some of the programs that you might be asking questions about. But we do have a prosecuting cold cases using DNA um, grant program that was funded last year um, that will more than likely would be funded again this year. But we do have a program that supports that. Okay, thanks for that, Christine. So we're at time now. I want to go ahead and just thank everybody for joining today. A lot of information to cover, and uh, we do appreciate your attendance. I want to thank the panelists today for their their time and their experience uh, with this, and hopefully you're able to, to clean a lot of good information for the grants and solicitations that will be coming out here uh, shortly. So once again, thank you all, and uh, look forward to the post-event posting of this material.